So it's healthcare. One of the reasons why we have this diverse, eclectic array hey, um, of people in the room um, is that healthcare affects everyone. And when you think about it in healthcare, everyone has a story. You do, or you have a close friend or a relative who does, and they're, they're important stories for you. And of course, I do too. That's how an engineer ended up in healthcare, right? There's something personal that draws you, that draws you in. And you know, what you find in each of these stories as you talk to people is it's important. You know, quality of life and dignity of death are at stake. And as you enter into one of these healthcare journeys, what you find is an incredible array of smart, hardworking, caring people. It's why Americans love their doctors and nurses, right? It was just, it's a sector of the economy full of amazing talent. Um, and yet, the results that are achieved aren't what we'd hope for. The outcomes are wildly variable. Some of them are just absolutely miraculous. And yet, when you look at the public health statistics, we don't stack up well relative to the rest of the world. And when you dig into the numbers, there's this incredible, unwarranted variation in the processes and outcomes that are used, and tremendous disparities across different ethnic and racial groups. It's just, um, it's not doing what we need it to do. So the goal needs to be improving health results. It needs to be improving health outcomes. And when you focus that way, you can align the interests when you're thinking about how do we improve the health outcomes. That's what patients want. That's what doctors want. Health plans would rather everyone were healthy. They would cost less. Employers want productive workers. The government wants productive economy. We can align interests if we get the, if we get the goal right. So that means achieving better outcomes for individuals and for families. So we're talking about creating value. And when you hear people talk about value, when you hear people talking about Del Med saying that it wants to improve healthcare value in Central Texas, what we're talking about is creating value for individuals, for families, and then that accumulates to for, for populations. But Lots of people, when they talk about value, are actually talking not about creating value, but about dividing value, right? Who gets what? And then they say, well, value for whom, right? But if you're talking about creating value, you're talking about value for the individuals, for the patients, for the individuals, for families, for the people being served. So when you're thinking about value-based health care, you need to be thinking about how do we create value for people? So how do you do that? How do you create value in healthcare? That's the thing that you then need to, need to be thinking about. Um, and of course, it depends, right? How, how you would create value for an individual, for, for a family, depends on what are the health circumstances that they face. So if somebody has diabetes with hypertension, the results that they need to improve are different from what someone's concerned about if they or their child have asthma. And those will be different concerns than someone who shows up with joint pain. And what it means to move the needle on health for people is different depending on the needs that they have. That turns out to be a really big statement. As obvious and as simple as it sounds, it turns out to be a really big statement because most of how healthcare is organized, paid for, delivered, is not aligned with how we create value for individuals, how we create value. And most of the discussion that you hear about value is about how we divide it. And all that fighting over how we divide value shrinks the pie, whereas if you're thinking about how to create more value, we're actually expanding the pie. So if we want to provide better health for more people, we need to be thinking about how we create or expand value. So what we mean by value is the improvement in a person's health for the money that we spend to improve it, to cross the full cycle of care. And a um, couple things to notice there. The first is, if we don't improve their health, there's no value. Right? There's no gain in paying less for something that isn't working. So from an employer perspective then, 
What is the, pro the problem with health benefits? They don't result in enough health improvement. But that's not the usual conversation. The usual conversation is just, how much are we paying? But really, if you want to get your money's worth for what you're paying for health benefits or what you're paying for health insurance, you need to be thinking about, um, are we actually getting the health improvement that we want? So the thing that employers need to recognize on this is that it's that poor health hurts employers. If you look at what employers are spending, the loss of productivity from poor health costs between two and seven times, depending on how you measure it and where you measure it, but it, it costs between two and seven times more than the direct costs on health care, on the appointments and procedures and drugs. The lost productivity costs even more than that. How can that be? Think about what's involved in that. So that's not just sick days, but also the days that people spend pursuing care and all the time they spend pursuing care and arranging it. Right? Uh, disability, presenteeism, you're at work, but you're so worried about your family member or you're, you're stressed or anxious or depressed and you're not getting the stuff done that, um, that you should be getting done. Early retirement caused by health problems. Um, so all of these things mount to tremendous productivity losses. Um, and the conservative studies show that those productivity losses are about twice the cost of 2.3 times the cost of, of the direct spending on health care. So as a self-insured employer, you want to be really thinking differently about this to bring down the overall costs on, on poor, of poor health. So the health care myth is that demand for health care is insatiable that people always want more. There's a famous RAND study that shows that, you know, given the choice, people always want more health care. OK, think about it for a minute. Do you? Extra, free, colonoscopy, You're down the street. You know, anybody signing up this afternoon? You don't really want more, right? Um, you really want more health. But in the famous studies that said people always want more, they confused health and health care. And so if you, if you commingle them and you can't tell the difference, then, may, then you think you want more. But what you really want more of is health. The good is health. So the healthcare reality is that the spending on health care is driven by poor health. You seek health care when that's what you need to do to, to get healthier. So the reality is we need to be dealing with poor health. And living in good health is inherently less expensive than living in poor health. But few employers think about it that way, and few employers really have a strategic approach to health. They tend to focus on cost rather than on value. So unlike the rest of their business, they're not asking, are we getting our money's worth for the money we're putting in? They're just asking, can we put in less money? Often. And then when they're thinking about cost, they tend to think about the cost of the benefits that they're spending, but not on the cost of poor health. So they miss half or more than half of the, of the equation by not thinking about the costs of poor health and how you address those. So we need to think about it differently. But what we get are these repeating efforts from this misalignment that we keep trying and we keep trying and they keep not working. I understand that it wasn't Einstein who said that insanity is trying the same thing over and over and expecting different results, but it was still smart, whoever said it first. Um, you know, we keep trying for consumerism, but if people don't have good choices, consumerism doesn't help. One of the companies we worked with thought that what they needed to do was give people skin in the game, so they kept raising the copay on emergency room use. And so their employees were just paying more and more and more for emergency room use for things that were um, essentially primary care. Uh, when they opened an on-site clinic, emergency room use dropped. But just raising the, the price of the emergency room didn't matter because people didn't have the choices they needed. So you can't just rely on consumerism if the choices aren't there. 
people work on cost shifting, but they're not getting lasting effects from that. If you succeed in shifting costs to someone else, the next time health benefits come around, someone's raised the price to cover what they're paying extra. And so you just, you just delay it a year, but we still see this spiraling up. So that's not working. And try to change the incentives, but are you creating incentives for people to spend less on benefits or incentives for people to do things that get health, that get them healthier and to provide services that help people to truly achieve good health? Or, um, or we, we work on stigmatizing things so that people won't pursue help for anxiety or depression or, I mean, or stress. So the, um, the consequences of trying the same things that don't work over and over are that the benefits aren't really addressing the core needs. And when people have a bunch of unmet needs, those then spiral into more and more poor health. So then your, your high blood pressure and your um, high cholesterol spiral into coronary artery disease or congestive heart failure over time. And it gets worse health and more expensive. We need to change the pattern. So what if we want to take a step forward? Then we need to create a health strategy that's built around employees' needs. And to do that, we need to understand what are the unmet needs now. We need to offer benefits that actually create solutions. So effective, efficient, convenient care. Solutions for employees so they can achieve better health. So what would it mean to have a health strategy? It means you'd have a coherent set of activities that really do address the needs in your employee and employee family population. And you'd be aiming to improve um, health care and improve health, and therefore productivity. So what people will say is, so you need a portfolio of programs. And this sounds like the same old, same old, right? And that look at what is the health plan, what should the health plan be doing? What do we need to do in the culture at work? And what do we need to be doing for care delivery? But my point is that if you start from understanding the health needs and the unmet or unarticulated health needs of employees, you will do those things very differently than if you just sort of start from where you are and march forward from there. So what I want to spend a chunk of time with you on is thinking about those unmet needs or those unarticulated needs. And how might you see this differently? Because that's, I think, the essence of the rethink, is thinking differently about those, about those core needs. So what we mean by understanding health needs is thinking about the drivers of poor health, which are also then the drivers of spending in your employee population. and. Uh, these may be different for different companies, particularly for some for small companies. You may find that what you need to be focusing on is not necessarily the same as what others are focusing on. But you want to think about what are the unmet needs that are leading to poor health or to the progression of chronic disease to bigger and bigger problems. So what do we mean, mean by unmet needs? They're usually not articulated. So part of the problem here is that um, people may have need for different types of support, but you don't tend to imagine what doesn't exist. You know, a few years ago, people weren't asking for a telephone that would take pictures of their kids in the park. You know, they weren't asking for Airbnb. So, um, so the, what, what you need to do to do things differently may be unarticulated, but that means you're not going to get it through the currently popular co-creation. So the necessary insights for this type of work, then, are to understand the concerns and the hopes of the people that we're serving, to understand the gaps in their benefits and in their care, um, and to see those in now invisible barriers, the obstacles to health that that are in the current setup so that we can look at it differently. So 
we've developed this experience group approach to getting insight on these unmet needs. But what this is is a way of bringing people who have shared medical circumstances, shared health needs, and some shared social needs uh, or social circumstances together. And we get them engaged together in a discussion about what it's like to live with what they're living with so that we can get additional insight. So it gives us a way to identify unmet needs, to identify gaps in care, to identify concerns, and then enables the team, the, the clinicians and the patients, but the team working together to, um, to create a different set of offerings. So the experience group insights come in three categories. One is you need to figure out a segment that has shared needs. And so as you bring people together, what you see is whether they quickly bond and start discussing um, what, they, what the needs are. When we bring together women with breast cancer, women with early stage breast cancer have different sets of concerns than um, women with very late stage breast cancer. If you think you're going to die of it, you have end of life concerns. If you're not, your, your major concern about quality of life, the functional capability that you're most worried about with breast cancer is cognitive impairment. If that's not what your first thought about what I was about to say was, you're with everybody else. We, don't, we haven't found providers who were thinking about it that way, but it makes a world of sense. Chemo brain is a big issue, and if you're recovering from breast cancer, you want to be able to still do the family finances, go to work, read to your kids, um, think, right? Um, but it, so you want to understand the seg segments and under understand the the differences in concerns among the segments. The second type of insights we get are on success metrics. And the thing here is that what we discover is that when you have a well-defined segment, there are usually about three things that the group is really, really concerned about. And they share those things deeply. So you can have a very small set of meaningful metrics. And then as, you, as they talk, you hear, and I'll explain this in a minute, you hear in the things people are saying where the unmet needs are, where, they, where they're running into obstacles. So you get a different kind of insight about what needs to be included in the services so that people achieve better health outcomes, more productivity, more, more re-engagement in their life. So when you're clarifying segments, we see things like a dispersed workforce with a lot of remote employees may have different concerns, different needs than a group of employees that are tightly co-located. The types of solutions that you can create will depend on that sort of work environment. Uh, so understanding the segments allows you to create care that works for a particular group. What we've found on success metrics is that in Group after group and concern after concern, the things that, the things that peop, individuals care about, the things that employees care about or patients care about, fall into three categories. One is capability. Can you do the things that allow you to be you in your life? And so which capabilities are at risk um, depend on what uh, health circumstances you're facing, but capability is um, are we restoring your capabilities is one of the important ways to see is your health care working. The second is comfort. Is your health care reducing pain, anxiety, depression, so pain and suffering? Um, but second way of asking, is your health care working, is it helping, is to ask, are we improving comfort? Are we reducing pain and suffering? And the third category is calm. Does life go on during care? Can you work? Can you have family dinner? Can you, does life go on? And this is really important because often when people think about outcomes, they're thinking about it as something that happens after care. But for chronic conditions, for long-term things like cancer, for end of life, for congenital conditions, the outcomes during care are the whole ballgame. And this gives us a way to get at some important aspects of patient experience that aren't hotel services or hospitality, but are about whether your life is supported by the way your health care is, is delivered. 
So capability, comfort, and calm are the, are the metrics that, um, that, we, that we work with. So if you, if you start thinking in terms of starting from needs and building from there, then you can create a strategy that defeats what the Europeans refer to as health nihilism. People will say, well, we're too small, or we're, our employees are too scattered. We can't make a difference. Or they'll say, we don't have enough influence on health. But you can. Um, or it's not my job. That's why we hire a health plan to administer this. They're supposed to take care of it. But they make more money if there's more health care claims. And that really hasn't changed yet. And perhaps even more importantly, even if they want to change, they know how they've always done it. And they know how to succeed with what they've always done in the past. So even when they're trying, change is hard. You're going to have to say, there's a different goal. I'd like you to achieve this. Let's talk about how we're going to do that. Because otherwise, they will go back to the goals that they've been working on before. So you can get started. Um, you have to go beyond just thinking about your data and thinking about what are the drivers of poor health in our group. Um, you need to think about, then, what are the unique needs and understanding the unique needs. What, are, what would be our unique solutions? And one of the interesting things about that is people are forever talking about trying to change the healthcare system. Be selfish. Just try to address the needs for your own group. And those unique solutions will help to catalyze change in the system. So look at the most pressing needs first. Look at the things that within your group are actually the things that are, that are the big cost drivers, the poor health drivers, the absenteeism or presenteeism drivers in your organization, and start there. Because waiting's not going to work, right? I mean, you can, we could wait for the government to fix it. I thought you'd laugh. Um, the, um, uh, when, when we started this work, we did our initial work in Europe. And, um, and twice, the uh, European uh, employers, these big multinational companies, said, those American firms, they have such an advantage because they pay for health care. And we went, what? And the first time, I thought it was a translation error. I, and the second time I heard somebody say it, I just stopped the conversation and said, did I misunderstand? And they said, no, no, you didn't misunderstand. In America, employers as payers can state directly what it is that they need or want. They can engage in the conversation. We have to work through the government. Can you imagine how slow that is? But that's not how American firms tend to think about it. But you know, um, so we, but we know waiting won't work. We've thought maybe that health plans or providers would make these changes, but it's going to take it's going to take private sector leadership combined with public sector leadership. It's going to take visionary providers getting out there. It's going to take um, it's going to take visionary companies working on measured outcomes. It's going to take it's going to take people coming from many different perspectives. But waiting won't work. From wherever you stand, there are steps you can take. Um, and those steps will catalyze change. And that's what we need you to do. So we need you to join us at redefining healthcare to its purpose, to being about achieving better health, quality of life, dignity of death. We can get there. And I'll tell you, having come to Austin, I have at UT the best colleagues I've ever had. There are a whole bunch of them in this room today, so if you talk to the people around you, you will discover a bunch of really, really cool people. But we have, we have a, a community that cares about change, wants to catalyze it, and has the resources to do so. So I'm really tremendously excited about what we can achieve. And I think we've got what it takes to do it. Thank you. Thank you.